Hi, it's Mr. Evans. Welcome to Room 310 Biology and the third HSA Biology Review. This one will mostly focus on cells and body systems. There's a great deal of vocabulary, so make sure you study and make sure you ask questions. I'd like to begin by talking about the prokaryotes. And if we see prokaryotic or prokaryotes, we should immediately think bacteria. There are the most numerous organisms on Earth. There's many, many, many different species. A few cause disease. Most of them we never realize they're even there. Uh, they're important as decomposers in ecosystems. Many of them we have a mutualistic relationship with. They help us digest our food. But regardless, all bacteria are going to have DNA. They have a chromosome with their genetic information stored on it. They have ribosomes and ribosomes make proteins using the information that is stored in the DNA. There is a cell membrane, a selectively permeable layer that controls what enters or leaves, and bacteria all have a cell wall for protection. The bacterium shown in this diagram has a flagellum, a whip-like structure that helps it move. Some bacteria will have that, but not all. When we take a look at eukaryotic cells, um, here's a little trick that might help you. U, eukaryotic, U rhymes with nucleus. Eukaryotic cells have a nucleus and they have membrane-bound organelles. Eukaryotic cells are much larger and when we think eukaryotic cells, we should be thinking plant cells. All plant cells are eukaryotic. We should be thinking animal cells. All animal cells are eukaryotic. We should be thinking about fungi, the yeast, the mushrooms, the mold, and we should be thinking protists. Um, if you don't recall protists from your unit on classification, uh, basically if you're not a bacterium, a plant, animal, or fungus, you are a protist. But all four of these are examples of eukaryotic cells. Uh, we need to have a handle on all of our organelles, so I'm going to do a quick rundown of functions here. Uh, the nucleus stores the DNA, houses the chromosome, uh, therefore the nucleus really directs the cell activity. It specifies which proteins get made when. Uh, the vacuole is very prominent in plant cells. It stores water. The ribosome manufactures protein. Proteins are made out of amino acids, and the order or the sequence of amino acids is determined by the information that's in the DNA. When I see mitochondria, I often put the prefix mighty in front. The mitochondria perform cellular respiration. So just like a car combines oxygen with fuel, your mitochondria combine a carbohydrate or some other type of fuel, usually it's glucose, with oxygen. And in cellular respiration, the main product we're interested in is ATP, the energy currency of cells. Uh, the ATP powers cell activity. So, for example, muscles require a lot of mitochondria because mitochondria provide the ATP that allow the muscles to move. And here, last on the slide, we have the chloroplasts. The chloroplasts found in plant cells performs photosynthesis. And in photosynthesis, we're basically taking light energy and converting it to chemical energy. So the plant makes carbohydrates. And the plant can use these carbohydrates in their mitochondria to power their activities. Uh, but it also starts all the food chains here on Earth. A few other structures that we should know. Uh, we know the cell wall is there for um, support and protection. We know that the cell membrane is selectively permeable. And by that, I mean that the cell membrane controls what enters and leaves. And it's due to that structure of the phospholipid bilayer. Uh, the phospholipids uh, allow some materials to get through easily, some not at all, and some need just a little bit of help through a protein channel. Um, the endoplasmic reticulum, or ER, there can be both a rough 
It's covered with ribosomes, so proteins are being exported or made there. There's also a smooth ER that is lacking the ribosomes, primarily functions to detoxify poisons. In terms of movement, some cells, not all cells, can move. A great example of a flagella, which is a long whip-like structure, is found on the sperm cell. The cilia are these short hair-like extensions found on the outside of this organism. They move back and forth much like oars in a boat to allow it to move. And finally, pseudopodia. Um, pseudo means false and pod means foot. So it literally translates to false foot. This organism is an amoeba and these long extensions of cytoplasm are pseudopodia. They uh, stretch out and then the whole organism kind of pulls after it, uh, moves like a blob, and maybe these pseudopodia also engulf food particles and, uh, and enable the organism to take in food. I really want you to know the difference uh, organelles between plants and animals. So think to yourself, what's unique what organelle is unique to plants, and you really should come up with a chloroplast. Plants can make their own food, animals cannot. Um, you should also come up with that cell wall. Animal cells lack cell walls because animals should be able to move, and if we had a cell wall, that would really limit our ability to move. Uh, plants also have that large central vacuole Animal cells might have a vacuole, but it will be very tiny in comparison. This takes up much of the interior of a plant cell. So can, can we think what they have in common? Both, both plants and animals have a nucleus to house the genetic information. Both have mitochondria, so they can perform cell respiration. Both are going to have ribosomes because they need to synthesize enzymes and other proteins. And both are going to have that selectively permeable cell membrane. In terms of cell reproduction, um, animals start out as a zygote, a fertilized egg, and then they become multicellular. They have to become two cells, then four cells, then eight cells, and so on. So how do you get to be a trillion cells big? Um, the answer lies in the process of mitosis. In mitosis, the nucleus divides, and the chromosomes are evenly distributed between two daughter cells. Well, to get that process started, we had to replicate our DNA. That occurred during the S phase of the cell cycle. These chromosomes actually duplicated themselves. They replicated. They're identical copies. The nucleus divides in a series of small steps, and we end up with two identical daughter cells. So the purpose of mitosis is so that a multicellular organism can grow, and it can repair or replace damaged cells. And mitosis is going to generate identical daughter cells. The DNA will be the same. There's no gene shuffling. It will produce identical daughter cells. Transport. Material needs to get into and out of cells. So the couple of key processes I'd like you to remember Diffusion, molecules move from areas of high concentration to low concentration until they reach a point of equilibrium. And if it's the diffusion of water we're talking about, well then we're looking at a different process, and that's osmosis. Um, here's an example of three plant cells in three very different environments. The cytoplasm in this cell is shrinking. It was in a hypertonic environment. Perhaps there was a lot of salt around the cell and the water left the cell. This cell is in an isotonic environment. Uh, water is moving in, water is moving out at about the same rate. Animal cells like to be in an isotonic environment, but plant cells really prefer a hypotonic environment. Water is continuously trying to move into these cells, 
fills the central vacuole and that pushes hard against the cell wall, helps the plant stand up nice and straight and tall. I'd like to do a little bit of a hierarchy too. Cells can organize uh, themselves into groups of cells of different types and then we'll have tissues. For instance, you have muscle tissue, you have bone tissue, you have um, skin tissue. Tissues of different types can organize themselves into organs. Uh, so you can list a whole lot of organs in your body, heart, lungs, kidneys, um, so on, stomach. Organs organize into organ systems, and the organ systems make up the organism. So if I have a group of the same type of organisms living in an area, for instance, all the white-tailed deer that live in the woods behind my house, I'm thinking of a population. So there's more than just white-tailed deer living in the uh, woods behind my house. There's squirrels, there's rabbits, a whole lot of different birds, many different types of plants. All the different populations living in an area make up a community. And we'll see a little bit more about that in the video on ecology. But I would like to take a look at some basic body systems. So let's run down a few. Your nervous system, your brain, your spinal cord, and all of your nerves are basically there to send messages and, and communicate between different areas. Um, your skeletal system, your bones, your ligaments, your tendons, is there basically for support and protection. Your muscular system, we need for movement. It has to work with your skeletal system because the muscles need something to pull against. Um, our digestive system breaks down food um, into molecules, to monomers that we can absorb. Our circulatory system is used to transport uh, things throughout our bloodstream, our heart, arteries, veins, and capillaries make up our circulatory system. It works closely with your respiratory system. Um, your lungs we use to exchange gases with the environment. Breathe in the oxygen and breathe out the CO2. Your immune system uh, your white blood cells, your antibodies we need for defense against invaders. And teenagers are always claiming to be full of raging hormones. Uh, that would be the job of your endocrine system. And basically these are chemical messages made in one part of your body um, that will communicate elsewhere. So Endocrine glands secrete a hormone that travels through your bloodstream and acts someplace else in your body. These are the basic systems that we need to know and their functions. And we'll take a look at a couple of practice HSA questions. Um, this question was asking what process is illustrated by this diagram. So I see an endocrine gland. It's producing a hormone. That hormone in high levels will actually stimulate another gland to produce a different hormone which inhibits or slows down the activity of gland A. So it's almost as if gland B and gland A are kind of working um, almost to keep each other in check and this process, I'm wondering if you remember the title of it, this process is called feedback. Endocrine glands sort of keep each other in check and may stimulate or um, inhibit the production of other hormones. And I'm hoping that everybody will take a look at some cell diagrams and be able to recognize a few basic organelles. So my question here is, do you recognize this organelle that's found in an animal cell? Well, I'm already thinking, well, it can't be a chloroplast because there's no chloroplast in animal cells. And I do recognize that it's got this heavily infolded inner membrane, gives it a whole lot more surface area. And this organelle happens to be your mitochondria. And I'm hoping you remember the function. It is to make ATP through the process of cell respiration. That's all the information I have for this video. Please remember to go to your teacher and ask lots of good questions.